Modern warfare is dominated by technology. Never more so than with the combat helicopter. Today's machines are lethal, agile and survivable. Put that together with new digital technology and you have the ultimate weapon that will revolutionise how battles are fought. After the Second World War, a new tool became available to commanders on the battlefield, the helicopter. It was now possible to move troops and their equipment rapidly across the combat zone. Helicopters didn't need airfields because they could take off and land from a space the size of a tennis court and they could operate over any terrain. Natural barriers like rivers, jungles and deserts were no obstacle to these machines. The Americans used helicopters in the Korean War to evacuate wounded troops to field hospitals. Helicopters that were made famous in the television series MASH. And because of the short journey times, many lives were saved that otherwise would have been lost. But it was during the Vietnam War that the helicopter really made its mark. Instead of marching to the battlefront, troops were flown in along with their equipment and ammunition. At first they were simply troop carriers, but soon they became a lethal attack weapon. Not only could they protect the troops and other helicopters, they could also unleash deadly force against the enemy on the ground. Helicopters had changed battle tactics forever. Today, the helicopter is moving to a new era, that of the digital battlefield. Using digital technology, commanders will be able to know the exact position of their troops, aircraft and weapons, as well as the enemy's position at any given moment in time. They will also be able to send this information instantly to their troops on the ground and in the sky using one gigantic military internet. This digital battlefield is seen as the most important advance in warfare since the helicopter itself. Leading the charge into the digital age is the deadliest helicopter ever built, the Apache Longbow. It is the supreme attack helicopter and the first to be wired for the digital battlefield. Using sophisticated radar, it can detect and attack multiple targets using its 30mm cannon, rockets and precision-guided Hellfire missiles. It is the number one killing machine and the number one flying machine for pilots. This is the most ultimate machine to fly. This is like flying a Ferrari. The Apache aircraft uh, was designed to be a heavy attack platform for the Army, so it provides not only a heavy attack type of, of capability, but it provides close air support as well as armed escort for other aircraft. The Apache is designed for combat both during the day and at night and has seen action in Panama, Somalia, Bosnia and both Gulf Wars.
its lethal record in combat is matched by its name. Army aircraft uh, are typically named after Indian tribes within the United States, and the, the Apache aircraft was named after the, the Apache tribe, which were fierce warriors uh, during the early times of, of the uh, United States. So it just was fitting to name this aircraft after the Apache tribe because we we're looking to make a very fierce fighting uh, weapons platform. One reason the Apache Longbow is so effective as an attack helicopter is that different detection and information processing technologies have been integrated into a single aircraft. On the nose of the aircraft are sensors that identify and track targets day and night using high-resolution television, infrared and lasers. The information from the sensors is displayed in the pilot's eyepiece on the helmet, which is linked to the gun, so wherever the pilot looks, the gun points as well. On top of the Apache is the Longbow Radar Pod, which is used to locate and track targets using a technique called unmasking. The helicopter hides behind cover, then appears above the tree line to allow the radar to detect the enemy before dropping out of sight again. What Longbow does on the Apache aircraft is it's that fire control radar. It's that ability to, in a matter of seconds, to detect, classify and prioritize targets and then download that data to be displayed in front of the pilot as well as downloading that information into the RF missile. The Apache Longbow is the first in-service helicopter upgraded for the digital battlefield. Missions are planned on computers and then transferred into the aircraft. In this way, the pilots can load all the data and navigation information for the mission instantly and without error. There's no way to overemphasize what digitization will mean to the battlefield because in the past, you typically saw the, the enemy, you engaged the enemy. Now you're able to quickly determine where the enemy is, where the friendlies are, and in a matter of seconds engage them with any weapon system on the battlefield. Because the longbow is digital, many of its systems can easily be replicated in a simulator. This means that pilots can be trained on a device that simulates real missions without ever putting aircraft or pilots at risk. At Fort Rucker, Alabama, the US Army is training Longbow Apache helicopter pilots on four state-of-the-art simulators, a bit like giant video games. They digitally replicate the exact flight profile and handling of the helicopter. It is, in fact, a uh, one huge video game. It's also a very expensive video game, and it, it's very real also. Obviously, what we do is very real. So it's a uh, huge benefit for us to have this trainer uh, so that we can train them up and have them ready to fight. The new trainees have the ability to come in here. They learn how to start the aircraft. They learn to familiarize themselves with the cockpits, then can fly the aircraft, get a little experience uh, actually flying the machine, and can actually work with their stick buddy. All right, you ready? I'm going to have to the left, so stay on it. On real missions, pilots must not only look out for the enemy, but also other Apaches. This system can even link the simulators together. There's an old joke about simulators where you have to watch out for the other simulators. Well, in here it's real. These simulators can be linked up together and you can actually look out left and right at the other simulated aircraft. Well, the Longbow Crew Trainer uh, allows us to simulate the digital battlefield. In here we can simulate almost everything, so it's essential uh, to the future. The simulator can recreate most battlefield scenarios, but when pilots are out on a real mission, it's real bullets being fired at them. The Apache Longbow helicopter's role is to engage the enemy, so it has to be able to survive hostile fire. It's designed with a slender profile, making it difficult to hit when attacked head-on and is heavily armoured around the cockpit. 
this right here is, a, is an armor panel that will come out and it will protect us on both on the, our sides. Um, in between the cockpit we have a, a blast shield that will prevent any kind of round. If a round does get inside one of the cockpits, it will not penetrate through to the other cockpit to take both pilots out. The flight controls and computer systems have backups in case they are disabled by enemy fire. In addition, the rotor blades and fuel tanks can take hits without failing, and even the gearbox can run dry of oil for 30 minutes to give added survivability. Simply a killing machine, and it requires special qualities to become its pilot. What's the aggressive nature of an attack pilot? The attack pilot is always out there looking for a fight, and he's willing to get into the scrap, and he's, and he's willing to put his neck on the line in order to protect the soldiers on the ground. The attack pilot is your more aggressive type A personality. He's going to go out there and his job is to want to get into the fight. He's going to have the courage to want to stay in the fight and to mission first, mission accomplishment. We're out there to protect the ground guys. We're out there to protect other helicopters that we may be escorting. And we're very, very mission oriented. Uh, this is the greatest job that you can possibly have. Uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. The thing that links all pilots everywhere is their shared passion for flying, regardless of the aircraft or its role. Nolan Beck has been flying for 18 years and is a test pilot on one of the most successful military helicopters ever made, the Black Hawk. I love to fly uh, any aircraft, but what I like most about the Black Hawk is its versatility. I can be moving troops one day across enemy lines, moving uh, cargo one day, and moving external loads the next day. It's very easily changeable. It's not the same mission every day. Black Hawk flies 50% of the Army's uh, flying hours. Fifteen hundred and fifty of them are still buying them to go to sixteen hundred and eighty. It performs every major aviation mission that we have. It can be fully armed and is fully armed in several configurations. The Black Hawk has been in every war the United States has fought since the 80s. It's a utility helicopter carrying out virtually every job on the battlefield. Troop and equipment carrying, medical evacuation, search and rescue, even command and control missions. The history of the Black Hawk is such that it was named for uh, Chief Black Hawk. He was a chief of the Sauk tribe uh, in, the, uh, in the Rock Island, uh, Illinois area. And uh, the chief sided with uh, the British in the War of 1812. And uh, subsequent to that war, he became uh, uh, very close to some of our leaders. In particular, in 1833, President Andrew Jackson uh, became very impressed with his candor, courage, and convictions. Uh, and we uh, became a great national icon. And subsequently, we named the aircraft the Black Hawk uh, after the chief. Black Hawk is a fairly powerful uh, aircraft. It, uh, it can lift a lot of troops and a lot of equipment and gets there quickly and uh, it handles quite nicely. It, uh, it's very responsive. The Black Hawk, like all combat helicopters, flies low when possible to avoid being detected and attacked. One of the other uh, great advantages of flying a helicopter is being able to fly at treetop level. This uh, reduces your exposure time to enemy forces, which enhances your survivability rate. Uh, 
uh, on the other side of that is that when you're flying close to the trees, anything that sticks up out of the trees could pose a hazard to your aircraft. So you have to constantly scan outside the aircraft and make sure you don't run into obstructions. I've flown uh, high-performance jets and helicopters, and flying a helicopter at treetop level, I think, is a lot more exciting than flying a jet in altitude. Automated weather observation two, two, five, four, Zulu weather. But for all its excellence, the Black Hawk is not equipped for the coming digital age. We seek overmatch of the enemy in so many ways, lethality, survivability, uh, sustainability, transportability. I mean, we have so many ways that we, are, we want to be far superior to our enemy, one of which is information or digitization. Information is crucial to success on the battlefield. Digitization provides the commanders and pilots with situational awareness, which is the ability to know at any given moment exactly where the enemy is, as well as friendly forces. Essential if one is to hit the enemy and not one's allies. You cannot overstate the significance of that. That's very, very profound. Colonel Lake sees it rather like a one-sided chess game. I guess there is an analogy, and I've heard it a long time ago when digitization was at its very, very inception, and, and these concepts were being briefed uh, to the leadership of the Army at that time, and uh, they likened it to a chess game where there was a two-way mirror, and uh, a person on one side was able to see what both teams were doing, and the other person could see only what he was doing in the mirror. And, um, and of course, it really gets worse than that because that person would likely not even be able to know what he was doing. But uh, that, that's probably a great analogy. You can see everything. They can only see what they're doing at best. Despite its superb combat record, if the Black Hawks to become part of the future digital army, it will need a digital upgrade. For about half the price of a new aircraft, uh, we can remanufacture the UH-60A models, give them 20, more, 20 years additional service life, full glass cockpit, getting rid of analog steam gauges, removing the obsolescence problem from the avionics. Uh, we refurbish the aircraft, treat it for corrosion and stresses and those sorts of things, uh, put on more powerful engines, wide cord blades, it becomes more maneuverable, it's going to fit in perfectly with the objective force and it'll give it, the Army, the utility helicopter for the next 20 to 30 years without having to go out and do a new start. For now, the Black Hawk has an interim upgrade with digital screens in the medical evacuation model. This is the HH-60L, the latest version of the Medivac Black Hawk helicopter. It has a Medivac interior with litters in the back and a forward-looking infrared mounted on the nose. If you look up front, the primary difference uh, on the cockpit is a step towards digitization to get away from the uh, old steam gauges. We have a flight management system, allows the pilot centralized control of all communications and navigation functions, and a multifunction liquid crystal display, which displays FLIR imagery and will also display flight plan and communication and navigation information. Keeping successful designs going is United States Army policy. One machine that has made the grade from analog to digital is Black Hawk's big brother, the Chinook. 50 feet long and weighing a mighty 32,000 pounds, the twin-rotored Chinook has been in service since the Vietnam War in 1972. But despite its age, it's been upgraded for the digital battlefield. Tandem rotors, a loading ramp in the tail, and the ability to carry heavy loads slung underneath makes the Chinook the most versatile military helicopter ever created. This 
one is, is named for a Chinook tribe, but also this one puts out a lot of wind and there's a Chinook wind. So uh, this is almost like a flying tornado with the amount of downwash that this aircraft puts out. Most helicopters like the Apache and Blackhawk use a main rotor for lift and have a smaller tail rotor that prevents the fuselage from spinning around. However, this uses a significant amount of engine power that could have been used for lift. On a tandem rotor helicopter like the Chinook, the two main rotors rotate in opposite directions, cancelling out any tendency for the fuselage to want to spin. And so all the available power from the twin engines goes to both rotors solely for lift. We talk about the Chinook being a tandem rotor helicopter and it being an innovation. It's not really an innovation. It's, it's a 40-year-old innovation that stood the test of time because it provides you such great longitudinal stability and control within the aircraft. The Chinook is the king of the heavy lift, being capable of carrying 26,000 pounds, the equivalent of a small tank. It's especially good at high-altitude work, where the air is thin and the efficiency of the blades deteriorates. It's been the only helicopter that the U.S. forces have had that have been able to operate in the altitudes in excess of 16,000 feet in Afghanistan. I don't want to get into criticizing my, my Black Hawk brothers because it's a great aircraft for what it's designed to do. It just was not capable of operating with any useful payload at that altitude. As well as being able to operate up high, the Chinook is just as good down low. It was designed to float like a boat and can land on water for special operations. These elite forces have adapted their Chinooks with long-range tanks and the ability to refuel in flight and added classified weapons and electronics to this remarkable aircraft. Because the Chinook is an extremely large aircraft, it requires a crew of four. Probably the most important aspect of flying this aircraft is proper crew coordination. There are pilots up front, however, probably the two most important individuals in the aircraft would be the flight engineer and the crew chief. Those individuals are responsible for securing loads, calling us into uh, landing zones, and uh, maintaining clearance of such a large aircraft. Like all pilots, Major Jones still has that passion for flight that started when he was a boy. Well, flying a helicopter is something I've always wanted to do since I was a child, and uh, flying at the speed of sound is, is certainly a thrill, but uh, I think there's nothing like flying on a deck, you know, right on top of the trees, at the Earth's surface, under night vision goggles with poor illumination. I don't, I don't think it gets any more challenging than that. There are several different versions of the Chinook, and the latest is being developed as a digital aircraft with computers and digital screens. It's hoped that these upgrades will extend the life of the Chinook for another 20 years, and it will successfully integrate into the digital battlefield. However, upgrading the pilots is not so simple. Old dogs like me that have been flying this thing for quite a while are used to all the old analog systems. The young kids coming up today have grown up with computers. They've accommodated it through learning through the processes. The learning curve to transition to this type of environment is more difficult for me because I learned on something else and I have what we call negative habit transfer trying to overcome that. Crosby's philosophy is if you want to test this system equitably, go to the mall and get the kid that's been playing the video games all day and come see how he does with it. With the United States moving towards a fully digitized army, will they still be able to fight alongside their less technologically advanced allies? We're going to work with allies, we're going to work with friends, and it doesn't make their systems ineffective if they're not digitized. It will reduce their effectiveness, as we have. That's why we're striving to digitize our platforms, because we see it as an, an effectiveness enhancement. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, the British Royal Navy is also working towards creating its own digitized helicopter force.
In Gulf War II, the closest ally that worked alongside the United States was the United Kingdom. The Royal Navy has its own fleet of combat helicopters, some among the most advanced in the world. Like the US helicopters, they have excellent designs. But in the race towards digitization, some still lag behind. One successful aircraft in need of an upgrade is the Royal Navy's Mark 8 Lynx helicopter. The Lynx holds the world speed record at 400 kilometers an hour and is designed as an anti-surface and anti-submarine helicopter. The Lynx is the, uh, the world's fastest production helicopter and it's very, very agile. It has a, a special rotor head which allows it to be uh, very aerodynamic in comparison to other helicopters. Makes it uh, a wonderful aircraft to fly as a pilot. It's uh, especially agile. It's, uh, it's not very forgiving in that it's, it, it is very twitchy, but uh, it, it's, it's like driving a sports car in a comparison to a lot of other helicopters, it's like driving a bit of a bus. A revolutionary British-designed rotor system allows the helicopter to fly faster because the paddle shape of the blades improves the airflow over their surface and delays the onset of blade stall. Keeping flight crew fully trained for war is a never-ending task. Today, 702 Squadron is being briefed on an exercise to fire live skewer missiles from the Mark 8 Lynx. OK, good morning, gentlemen. The aim of this morning's brief is to uh, fire and to brief for the firing of 15 live sea skewer weapons. Each crew today will fire... This is a rare occasion to fire live missiles, so the crew listen for. attentively. The targets you're firing against are 20 nautical miles to the northwest of Aberporth, in Cardigan Bay, and they consist of four 100-foot barges with radar reflective targets attached to them. In addition, they have... Sea skewers are our primary anti-surface weapon. Um, we have 15 missiles to release. Some of them are reaching their end of their life, and we're also trying to ensure that some of the younger people on the unit are getting some experience of firing their missiles. Skewer is a, a semi-active, uh, medium-range missile, and its primary aim is to uh, damage and uh, set on fire, if you like, uh, smaller fast patrol boats and smaller frigates, corvette size. Two consists of a pilot and an observer. It's my role to detect the enemy uh, shipping, uh, to classify it so that we know whether they're actually firing at the right target, and then to deploy the weapon. To do that, I'd eliminate it with the radar, and then using the radar, I guide the missile onto the target. The Sea Skewer is an extremely effective missile. Its high explosive warhead only detonates once it penetrates the skin of the ship, creating internal fires. flown with live skewer many times in Bosnia and Kosovo in the 90s. However, it's the first time I've ever fired one. It was very exciting, actually. A little nervous, obviously, but it's a very good uh, high feeling of satisfaction when the missile drops off, the motors go, and on further inspection, when we had a look at the targets, it hit exactly where we expected it to hit. The mission was a success, with the skewer blasting a hole through the target. In addition to the skewer missile, the Lynx can also carry torpedoes and depth charges for anti-submarine warfare. 
It has recently acquired a new half-inch calibre machine gun for use against fast-moving craft. But for all the Mark 8 Lynx's effectiveness in combat, it is yet to be digitised for the future battlefield. To enable us to be part of the digital battlefield, we need to have the same equipment and the compatible equipment with all our uh, NATO and other allies that we are likely to work with. The other aircraft within the Fleet Aerom are getting to the digital battle space. That includes the Seeking Mark 7 and the Merlin. We're a little way behind that, but the uh, upgrades we are expecting to get in the next uh, few years should enable us to catch up and be, port be part of that integrated picture. Some Royal Navy helicopters have entered the digital battlefield. And it's the Sea King, for many years workhorse of the Royal Navy, that now houses the technology to bring the fleet into the 21st century. is over 30 years old, the new Mark 7 version has been radically improved electronically. Using a large, movable radar pod on its side, it is now the first advanced surveillance and control helicopter in the world. The avionics have been completely upgraded, so the radar is new. It's a very powerful radar, and in addition to that, it's got state-of-the-art data link, which is basically real-time information relay to anybody within the uh, theatre of operations. It's a massive leap for the Navy. The main thing is we've moved away from a single role of AW to airborne surveillance and control, which means the carrier can take away this platform with them and carry out complete battle space management, control of aircraft, ships and land forces in one platform. What makes the Mark 7 Sea King so special is that it can actually process three different radar modes at the same time. This means it can relay information between sea, air and overland contacts and control all those areas of operation instantaneously, while at the same time sending the data back to its ship on a new fast digital connection known as Link 16. Other platforms that are used in that role are normally large fixed wings with a dozen or so crew. The beauty of this is that we can stick this on an aircraft carrier with three crew and provide pretty much the same service. Although the equipment was very new to the crews of 849 Squadron, while working alongside the Americans in Gulf War II, they produced some spectacular results that were crucial to the Allied campaign. In Gulf War II, Mark 7 played a vital role, not only for our own forces, uh, but the Link 16 enabled it to integrate with the Americans and also our troops on the ground as well. So we were able to relay that information instantaneously to them. 150, As advanced as the Mark 7 is, there's still room for further development on the helicopter. One area that we still need to address is exactly that, our own self-defence. Uh, we're looking at various systems at the moment that will provide our aircraft with its own defence aid suite. So at the moment, we are heavily reliant on other forces actually protecting our aircraft. But the performance of the Mark 7 has been so impressive that new capabilities are being discovered almost daily. There's still an awful lot to learn. I mean, we've only had it really uh, front line for just over a year. Uh, so we're learning things all the time. I mean, the, the Gulf War was a massive learning curve for us and, and that's, that's continuing. From the most sophisticated surveillance and control digital system in the world to the most modern combat helicopter in service anywhere, the Royal Navy's Merlin. It's the first helicopter to be developed by the Royal Navy in 25 years, and it's a quantum leap forward in technology for the United Kingdom. It's a fantastic aircraft to fly, very, very manoeuvrable. I mean, given the size of it, um, it's particularly manoeuvrable. Um, 
I've flown five or six different types of helicopters now, but this is certainly my favourite. There's a lot of power, the Rolls-Royce engines produce a lot of power for the aircraft, and uh, it's real fun to fly. The Merlin is without doubt the most advanced in-service helicopter in the world today. Uh, it's got a fantastic avionics suite, three engines, redundancy in almost every system. But also there, we can stay out for longer by shutting one of the engines down in flight, um, which makes our endurance uh, particularly good, up to four and a half to five hours with one engine shut down. The Merlin has two main roles in combat, anti-submarine and anti-surface warfare. We can carry four Stingray torpedoes, four Mark II depth chargers, or a variety of GPMG general purpose machine guns which we can mount in the cabin door and the windows. The radar is very powerful and it's what we call a pulse compression radar. So what it does is send a very powerful pulse out a long distance and we can track contacts up to 160 miles away. What the radar also does is automatically track those contacts for us and give us the tracking and time information which again can be transmitted on the data link back to the surface units. On the six LCD displays we have all the information from the sensors which are displayed in a variety of colours. For example, the hostiles we can display as red, the friendlies we can display as green, and those colour displays are sent to the ship. So straight away, when that comes through on Datalink, the ship knows whether we think it's a hostile or a friendly unit. Because the Merlin is digital, it's easy to run simulated missions. There's a dedicated Merlin training centre which houses four simulators, all of which can be linked from one main control room. This allows the crews to practice all types of missions in a safe, controlled environment. All this high technology and promise of a future digital battlefield to be viewed and fought on computer screens makes war begin to sound like one giant video game. But what would such a game look like? There's a possibility to glimpse this future at an army base in Alabama. At Fort Rucker, they're training officers and pilots to fight wars on a super simulator called the CAV Sim. In this mock headquarters, commanders are learning how to fight today's battles with their troops and helicopters. They're in communication with their pilots flying eight simulated helicopters. Each cubicle can be configured to provide any helicopter needed for the exercise. Boy, here we go. Might be able to pop up as well. Roger, spot report to follow. Break to observe the town. But yeah, stay behind that ridge line. Crowd north, vicinity, garage check, check. increase. Add one, two, we're coming right to uh, not hostile. Break. Here in Master Control, also known as the Both Stealth Room, instructors play God, managing the battle as well as controlling the enemy. In charge is Captain Dan Knott. The commander tracks the battle using post-it notes on a regular map and butcher blocks or a piece of paper just to write things down. From there, they translate it up to me via the radios to where I can then see what's going on in their eyes. Whereas in reality, I'm watching a computer screen that tells me exactly where everybody is and how the computer links in the enemy and the friendly and the aircraft. And I can see the big picture, much like what you're going to have in a few years, where everything is tracked, all the vehicles, we know exactly where they are, we know exactly where the enemy is. They can see everything. A true vision of how battles will be fought in the future. My position mark with yellow smoke. It is very similar to a video game, and I tease my, my children and my wife on a daily basis that that's what I do all day is play video games. Roger, just got a call from Eagle 5. Uh, what he wants to do, break. But the video game is becoming reality. In West Palm Beach, Florida, it's the dawn of a new age for warfare, the digital age.
In a research facility in southern Florida, the world's first helicopter conceived and designed to be totally digital is under test. Called the Comanche, it's scheduled to be in service in 2009. Everything from detection systems to flight controls have been created to work in the digital battlefield. This aircraft is the culmination of everything that has gone before and can truly be called the ultimate combat helicopter. Head of the project, Colonel Bob Birmingham, has watched the programme develop over many years. This is aircraft number two. It's our second Comanche prototype. We've had a very successful flight test programme and this has been a major part of it. On the front end, we have recently integrated our electrical optical sensor system, and then very soon in the future, we're going to be able to design in our laser warning receiver and our radar warning receiver on the front end of this. The cockpits we designed really to be identical in terms of the way the flight control systems operate and what the displays are going to show the pilots, and we did that really to reduce the amount of training that it's going to take uh, to really operate the aircraft. This is uh, really where we're going to house our missile systems and also gives us the capability to store internal fuels that, uh, as we need to go and fly deeper missions. You can see that there's really no exhaust system on here. We're really going to vent the exhaust and we're going to cool the exhaust and the heat from that through an exhaust system that's going to run all the way down to the tail. When you get down to the tail and if you take a look up at the rotor system, you can really take a look at uh, why this aircraft is really different. These are the bearingless rotor system, five-bladed rotor system with torque tubes that run through the system, give it a tremendous amount of power and strength and flexibility. On the fantail, uh, again, a very robust design. This really handles about 900 shaft horsepower that comes straight back uh, from the engines in there. And you can see that how we've got this design is a very protected area, really gives it a tremendous capability protection against uh, enemy threat systems, ballistics capability, and again, a very, very unique and robust design. Unlike previous helicopters, flight control computers ensure the pilot flies within the limitations of the machine. They prevent him overstressing the airframe and rotor system or damaging the engines by using excessive power. This fly-by-wire system gives the Comanche some unique handling qualities. Test pilot Bill Fell explains. I've flown a number of other helicopters, and if you, in another helicopter, took the stick and took it to the extreme of one lateral axis to the other extreme lateral axis, even if you did it slowly, you've probably broken something in that helicopter. In this helicopter, I can slam the stick from one side stop to the other side stop as fast as I possibly can and I haven't broken anything. All I've done is achieve some incredible roll rates. As a result, the aircraft can perform maneuvers that until now designers could only dream about. This aircraft, we can fly backwards uh, in excess of 80 knots. We can fly sidewards in excess of uh, 70 knots. Uh, those are not things that uh, you can do in other helicopters, and this aircraft handles it very well. You also, in flying backwards at 80 knots or sidewards at 70 knots, you can do that with your hand off of the controls. It will do it all by itself. Basically, if the computer is flying the aircraft for you, then it reduces your workload so that you can perform other tasks. You can assist in targeting, uh, and assist in uh, communications, the Comanche was designed from the start to be survivable on the battlefield. It's officially not called stealthy, but it is said to have low observability. It has an extremely thin shape, making it difficult for radar to detect and hard to see at a distance, and its retractable landing gear further reduces its observable profile. 
Also, by burying the engines internally and having a clever design of tail rotor, the noise generated is greatly reduced. To minimise the risk of thermal detection, the hot exhaust gases from the engines are cooled inside the tail before leaving the aircraft, thus reducing the threat of attack from heat-seeking missiles. Every system on the aircraft is digital, but what sets the Comanche apart is the onboard information gathering computers. The brains of this aircraft really have to do with the aircraft's ability to collect information. Uh, all totally integrated into the cockpit, into the mission control computer cluster. That provides the capability with a tremendous amount of information from the sensors that go out there. These digital detection systems will be able to provide the commander's backup base with constant information on the position of the enemy and their own forces. The Comanche will become the eyes and ears for the commanders of the future, giving them the power to control the battlefield. Comanche is, is clearly a skip a generation technology. This is not one generation better than its predecessors that we have out there. This is two generations better. This does things twice as good as any of the conventional aircraft that we have out there, and it does it twice as fast. This will transform the world. This will change the way that, uh, that we fight wars uh, in the world. This is an information system, and, and information is power, and that's what Comanche provides to the future commanders.